All right, I've been looking forward to this one. We've been DMing back and forth over the last week or so after I read his awesome article on the biggest off-season topics over the next couple of months during the quote-unquote slow time. He's Ari Marov, who you need to follow on social media, at my sports update. Does an unbelievable job for the 33rd team, and now he joins us here on the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. All right, I think this is your second time on. Really appreciate it. Good to see you again. Well, great to see you, Ross. It is the second time. And, you know, this is the quiet portion of the offseason. The NFL tries to create events. Of course, we had the schedule release just last week. They try to hype up, you know, the OTA videos where there's no one wearing pads and the Madden ratings have become a thing. So um, they're going to try to keep the conversation going. But um, we're entering that portion where there's not as much going on. Right. Which is where you come in because your article at the 33rd team kind of reminded me, okay, there are some there are some big things happening over the next couple months that, you know, people start going to the beach or summer vacations. And, you know, there is a downtime in the NFL from like mid-June to mid-July, but there's still business going on, um, including – some potential quarterback extensions because we've seen uh, Joe Burrow talking about it recently. Uh, maybe not as much Justin Herbert, but now that Hertz and Lamar Jackson have gotten done, are you expecting Herbert and Burrow already to both get deals done before the season or not necessarily? Yeah, I mean, I would imagine both of them get done here. You know, whenever with these quarterbacks, it's become a bit of the norm that after year three, if you think you have your quarterback and he is going to be the guy for the next, you know, 10, 15 years, you get the contract done as early as possible, simply because, first of all, you know he's the guy. But secondly, the quarterback market always goes up and the salary cap always goes up. So get the deal done as early as possible, like Josh Allen did. Um like Patrick Mahomes did. If you have the guy, get it done. And that's really what they're working on. The entire offseason entering this thing, there were the four quarterbacks who had to get paid. And I kind of had a feeling there was going to be a chance where there might be some waiting game going on. Because as you know, Ross, they always, you know, the other one other one wants to top each other. So we got Hurts done first. Then Lamar went a million dollars more than him per year. And now the other two are left. But I'm curious to see who ends up going first. And more importantly, really, the thing about them and what makes it more interesting is that they both have two years left on their contract while Hertz had one year left and Lamar had none left. So whatever they end up signing, if it's a four-year deal, it's really a six-year deal. If it's a five-year deal, it's really a seven-year deal. And because, like I mentioned, the cap keeps on going up and the quarterback market always goes up, you don't want to sign for too many years because eventually that contract looks a bit outdated. Look at Patrick Mahomes. He signed a 10-year deal, really a 12-year deal because he had two years left. He's already number seven in terms of average annual value. After these two guys get done, he'll be at number nine. So you look at that, and the one thing I'll be curious about whenever it does get done is how many years are they signing up for because that will be crucial here. What Burrow said this week was pretty important that he wants you know, to help out the team. Maybe that means he will go for longer years. So that element of whenever the contract gets done will It'll be interesting to see what ends up happening. That's a good point. And I am curious, Ari, to your point about which one of them goes first, because there is this kind of leapfrog thing where the one guy always tops the other guy, but it shouldn't be the case where Herbert gets more than Burrow. So does Burrow wait till Herbert gets it done to make sure he gets more? Or are the Chargers waiting for the Bengals to get it done with Burrow so in their mind, that becomes the ceiling for Herbert, you know? Yeah, I'd imagine there's a bit of a, a staring match going on over here. Both these guys do have different agencies, and that could be part of it. But I think we both probably agree Burrow has accomplished more so far, and he probably will be the one who ends up on top once it all gets done. Um, that's the way I look at it. I know Burrow's agent is the same agent as, let's just say, a guy like Joey Bosa, who, of course, is on the Chargers. But both these teams are family-owned businesses. So when it comes to the idea of these type of contracts, it gets very interesting with um, – how much they want to give up front. So I remember with Joey Bosa, for example, who I said has the same agent as Burrow, he literally took every possible ounce uh, of a deal from that team. And if you remember, um, Ross, it literally went down to the final day before training camp started. So um, I could see Burrow ending up taking his time over here because of the agent that, that he has and the way they've historically done deals. Okay, so you mentioned Mahomes being, you know, seventh in average per year, the long contract. Um, I can't even remember how many years into it he is at this point. 
But do you think that the Chiefs will adjust it this offseason? Yeah, I mean, he has, I believe, nine years left on his contract. And when he signed that deal, I mean, he knew what he was signing up for. I mean, like, he became the highest paid quarterback at the time, $45 million per year. Ross, if you remember, that was during the COVID offseason. So all these teams were like, we don't have ca cash on hand, you know, so it's better if you do a long-term deal or whatever. So if you look at the overall deal that um that he ended up doing his cash flow over the first three years which is what he's played so far has been about 63 64 million dollars so he's been making 21 million per year in cash over these last three years where he's getting the chiefs to the afc championship game he's getting them to the super bowl and winning the big game and all these other quarterbacks have surpassed him in a big way look at lamar's deal lamar is making 80 million dollars just in year one you know, Mahomes made $63 million over the last three years. So his contract is a very, very team-friendly contract, and the Chiefs have taken advantage of it. They, Because of that deal, they were able to extend, um, you know, Chris Jones, extend Travis Kelsey, bring in other players, and as a result, they've been winning. And, you know, the thing about it is that, you know, people are talking about his contract. As of up until now, Mahomes has not made a big fuss about it. So really, the Chiefs don't have to do anything with it. They could keep it the way it is. The one thing that I kind of proposed in the article was more because right now he's seventh in terms of average annual value and eventually he'll be ninth. Maybe they just tack on more cash somewhere in that nine years left just to bring the average up. So it's back up to par. And of course, they could keep on doing all the cab maneuvering with the way they've been doing up until now. So that was kind of my proposed idea, but they could also just do nothing, keep it the way it is. Patrick is making a lot of money off the field and let's just keep on winning while having all this flexibility um, with Patrick's contract. So um, there are two different ways of this, but for now, Patrick has not done anything publicly that tells us that they're going to have to do something. So um, this is one to watch after Burrow and Herbert get paid. What about the guys on the franchise tag? I, I forget. I know it's Barkley and Pollard. Who is it? And... Do you think they get done? Because running back in particular is tough. Yeah, so we have Barkley with the Giants, Jacobs with the Raiders, Pollard with the Cowboys, and then Evan Ingram, the tight end with the Jaguars. The one negotiation that has had at least optimism to eventually get done is probably Evan Ingram with the Jaguars. Both sides have kind of made it clear. We're talking, we're discussing. He was he had an amazing year in his first year with Trevor Lawrence, with Doug Peterson, and they want to get something done there. We know in this league, Ross, deadline spur action. Deadline this year is July 17th. So we still have two more months, really, until something must get done there. The other three are really interesting because they are running backs. And the, the one that's most interesting is going to be really Saquon Barkley, who his negotiation with the Giants has been a very on and off one it's been at times rocky and you know there was a press conference I believe right before the draft where Giants GM Joe Shane basically did not want to answer any questions about the topic he basically said we have not talked in a couple of months so I look at Joe Shane in particular with the Giants he came from Buffalo and you look at the Bills and their history with Brandon Bean they've always drafted running backs in round two three four whether it was James Cook Devin Singletary Zach Moss they always wanted to get those running backs in those middle rounds use them on those cheap contracts and take advantage of it so I've always wondered are the Giants going to be that team where they're going to pay big money to a running back who has played five full years in the NFL already. And we know the running backs, eventually the tread on the tire ends up falling off. And Saquon has had injuries in his career. So that could be part of the concern over there and why that one is probably the most interesting one. Pollard, historically, the Cowboys have always taken franchise tax to the final day, to the final week, really, whether it's Des Bryant, um, Dak Prescott, Tony, um, there was um, um, Demarcus Lawrence. They've always taken it to the end, whether it gets done or it doesn't get done. And then Josh Jacobs with the Raiders, it's been kind of quiet there, and it's kind of difficult to figure out exactly what's going on. So there's two more months left, but um, those are the four situations right now. Got it. Well, uh, during those two months, I'll be enjoying a bunch of Labatt Blue Lights, Ari, uh, because I don't really care about these guys' contracts. I do care about the beer that I'm drinking with friends and living life to the power of we. Always enjoy responsibly beer, Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. All right, so Ari, it doesn't make any sense to me that DeAndre Hopkins would play for the Cardinals this year. I mean, they're not going to be a good team. We don't know when Kyler's going to play. They're stockpiling draft picks for next year. I mean, he's going to get traded at some point, right? Or maybe not. 
Yeah, I mean, I think everyone around the league thought he would get traded this offseason. And the Cardinals, with this new regime, Monty Austin for Jonathan Gannon, gave him permission to seek a trade on his own with his agent, who he had hired this offseason, because previously he was actually representing himself. And over the course of two, three months, they were never able to find a trade partner, in large part because of his contract. DeAndre is owed $19.45 million in base salary this season, and no team was willing to take on the full contract plus give up a round two, three, four pick to Arizona. So that was really the holdup. And I think DeAndre kind of realized that as of right now, if no one's trading for me, the only place where I'm making my full contract is in Arizona. Now, of course, we're going to eventually have more time go by. The training camp will come around, for example. I mean, the, the reality is injuries do happen in places. And as you mentioned, Arizona is not really planning to be a competitive team this year. We saw what they did in the draft, the way they added a, an extra one and extra three. So would they be willing to eat some of the contract? Would DeAndre be willing to take a pay cut somewhere in order to facilitate a trade and for Arizona to add another pick into their treasure chest for 2024, where they are loaded with pick so i i do think eventually something could end up happening it's hard to envision him playing for arizona but if no team is willing to step up in terms of the contract i think deandre realized and that's why he put that instagram post saying that you know i'm back in arizona was simply because he realizes right now the only place he's making nearly 20 million dollars is with the cardinals so he's gonna wait it out and i guess well you know the cardinals are perfectly fine with that because the season doesn't start until september what about ari brock purdy because I'm really interested in this. You know, you see some reports, it's going well. He'll be ready for training camp. But then Kyle Shanahan had this quote after the schedule came out that I'm glad we're not playing at Philly week one. I'm glad it's week 13 because I want to have our whole team there. And we didn't feel like we had that the last time. To me, that was a real like, wait, what? Who's not going to be there week one? Like, why would you say that? That, that made me think, they're not expecting Brock Purdy to play in the opener. Yeah, I don't think they're really sure yet. And let me explain why. When Brock had the surgery, I believe it was around March 9th, March 10th, basically the 49ers were told it's a six-month recovery, but we'll know for sure where he's at and we'll have real clarity after three months. So that's coming up in June. And that's when they'll really know where he is in his recovery and when he'll be ready. So that's really the sticking point right now is to figure out where Brock Purdy is. But Entering this offseason, um, going back to the combine in Indianapolis, there was this talk going around and rumblings that there might be a quarterback trade that nobody's ready for. And the belief was it's going to be Trey Lance in San Francisco. And eventually, a week before the draft, we get this report out there that um, the 49ers are willing to try to do a trade. And my belief is that simply was put out there because the 49ers' first pick in the draft was number 100. Could we possibly get something for Trey Lance where we're picking a little bit higher in this draft? And clearly, nobody stepped forward with an offer. So it's pretty clear the 49ers are moving forward with Brock Purdy as their quarterback, and they signed Sam Darnold to be the guy behind him. And Ross, I don't know if you realize this, but the Sam Darnold contract was a one-year deal for $4.5 million, but there's upside in there up until $11.5 million if he's playing and on the field. So clearly they believe in him as somebody who could play if Brock is not ready for the start of the season. So once that June period comes along and we have real clarity on when Brock is going to play, if they get the green light that they're hoping for of his recovery, what ends up happening with Trey Lance really becomes interesting. They don't have to trade him. It might be the smart thing just to carry all three quarterbacks this year after seeing what happened last year. But as a team that needs a quarterback come training camp and something happens and Brock is good to go and he'll be ready to go around September, then what happens with Trey Lance becomes a bigger story over here. It's a really good point because then what is he third string? Maybe they can trade him then. Maybe they uh, can get something for him. Maybe there's an injury somewhere else. Uh, it's interesting. I wonder, do you think, Ari, did you hear anything? Were there any teams interested in him? I mean, obviously they tried. There had to be somebody that maybe kicked the tires a little bit. Well, there's multiple teams around the NFL who have the San Francisco branch, basically, because, you know, former GMs and former coaches. That was San, um, Houston with D'Amico Ryans. There was Tennessee with their new GM, Rand Carthon. Um, Minnesota with Quasi Adolfo Menza. All those guys have worked previously in San Francisco, and they were there when they drafted Trey Lance. And two of those teams so far ended up taking quarterbacks with Stroud 
and Levis. And then Minnesota right now has Kirk Cousins with one year left on his contract, and they haven't had much talks on an extension. So the one team I've consistently thought about is Minnesota. Trey Lance in, grew up in Minnesota. He played in North Dakota State, which is right next door to Minnesota. So that's the one team that I've you know consistently thought about. They didn't draft a quarterback in the draft, of course, even though people thought they might. So um, I'm not really sure which team it would be, but from when looking around the NFL right now and the situations with quarterbacks, the Vikings are the one that really sticks out to me. Check him out on social media at my sports update on Twitter. Absolutely invaluable. One of the 74 Twitter accounts I follow is my man Ari Mayrov at my sports update. Thank you so much for coming on the show again. Keep up the great work at the 33rd team, man. That was an awesome article. Popped up on my feed. I was like, yes, I want to know what I need to be worried about the next couple months. Thank you, Ari. Thanks, Ross. Great being on.